Hello everybody, and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 172. Feels like a good number, I don't know why, it just does. Anyway, today we're going to be looking at questions taken from Guide 225 on the USS Washington, and the Wednesday video on Fleet Admiral Ernest King. That seems to have been quite a popular one with everybody, so let's begin. Inquiring Mind wants to know... Are there any details concerning the phenomenon of vibration at speed on USS Washington? So briefly, it had to do with skegs. What are skegs, you might ask? Uh, well, for those of you who aren't aware, um, skegs are these fully enclosed, effectively fairings, or protection, if you want to call them that, for propeller shafts. All US fast battleships had them. The Iowa class and the North Carolina class had skegs on their inboard propellers, so I'm using here a picture of an Iowa class battleship, mostly because I couldn't find a decent quality picture of North Carolina or Washington uh, in dry dock showing off their underwater form. Um, if you look at the South Dakota class, they have outboard propeller skegs, so they actually create a much bigger tunnel. The two inner screws are actually inside that tunnel. But So this is not a North Carolina class, but it's close enough that you get a general idea. Anyway, the problem with the skegs is that, I mean, they do have a lot of uses, and one of them is theoretically increasing the hydrodynamic efficiency of the ship because it can help to direct the flow of water. But if you get it wrong, which it appears the designers of the North Carolina class did, then you get some rather serious issues because you have created a tunnel within uh, the underside, well, underside of the ship and the water flows through that and of course as you can see it interacts with the propellers at the end and when you get that wrong you set up a resonance which is amplified because it's inside this semi-enclosed environment and that's where you get the big vibrational issues that are caused in the North Carolina class. Now obviously they refined the design of the skegs in the South Dakotas and the Iowas, so they didn't have any problems on that level of scale that they had with the North Carolinas. And this is why it could never be actually fixed with the North Carolinas. That problem was always going to happen. The interface between uh, the water coming through the tunnel created by the skegs and the vibration and frequency of the propellers caused obviously by the blades going round and round. Uh, because simply you couldn't remove the skegs. They were part of the ship's integral hull design. And so as long as they existed, uh, which meant basically as long as the ship existed, some frequency somewhere was going to set off the vibration issues that the ship, and well both ships, North Carolina and Washington, experienced. This was why switching the screws for diff multiple different types was so important, because um, by changing that, you changed the resonant frequencies produced by those screws and thus as i said because you can't eliminate the problem you could at least move the problem to a different frequency band that was produced at a different set of revolutions and a different speed and this is an, a, what happened with north carolina and washington eventually after a bunch of experimentation with different screw types they ended up with a solution that as mentioned in the washington video removed most of the vibration issues when they were operating at top speed but relocated them to a speed bracket that was just above regular cruising speed which whilst not ideal especially if you were transiting through that speed bracket was better than nothing because it didn't quite affect the ships as long as they were at their more regular cruise speeds and it there also then didn't affect the ships too much when they're at their absolute maximum speed so the sort of high teens of knots bracket that the vibration issues now showed up in the most was actually a speed regimen which the ships very, very rarely would ever actually encounter. Lord Crush 777 asks, Why wasn't a Tennessee class or any other capital ship that survived the attack on Pearl Harbor preserved? There's a couple of factors in play, um, and two sayings that I've heard quite often quite neatly help to understand it. One is familiarity breeds contempt and the other is nothing is valuable until it's at least belonged to your grandfather. 
you might have heard variations of both of those in your own lives. The first one, familiarity breeds contempt, basically at the time things are only really valued if they're particularly special for the, for the time period. Um, if you're familiar with something, even if from a remote, more logical perspective, it might seem con particularly valuable, then but the one who is familiar with it and thinks of it as a day-to-day -day thing is not going to treat it as such, or maybe not as much. And you probably find this in your own life. You know, if you've got a valuable family heirloom, for example, uh, hopefully one that's not incredibly fragile, but still something you might want to display, um, looks pretty nice, you might have that on your mantelpiece or your shelf or in a display cabinet. And yeah, initially you think this is great, but over time, years and years, it just becomes part of the furniture. You don't think too much about it, other than thinking it, that it looks okay. It looks pretty nice, quite happy to have it. But then perhaps when a relative comes over, it's like, oh, is that, is that the thing that belonged to great uncle so-and-so? Wow, can I have a look at it? And you're kind of sitting there going, okay, calm down. Um, it's not that great because it's exactly the same object but it's just a different level of familiarity and this is the thing with a lot of these older ships immediately post-war people knew about them, sure but West Virginia, Colorado um, Tennessee, California yeah, they were battleships and yeah, there were people with some very fond views on them but they were one of dozens of U.S. Navy battleships. So when one or the other went to the scrapyard, well, so what? There were plenty of others. And yes, the other ones might have looked a little bit different. And yes, maybe some of the others hadn't been to Pearl Harbor. But at the end of the day, they're all battleships, would have been a, a kind of a general opinion. And obviously there would be some people who, at the time who appreciated their historical value, but not enough. And it kind of ties into the other saying which is that nothing is valuable until it's belonged to at least your grandfather and that is simply the fact that people value things that they perceive as older and more removed from them considerably more than um, how they value them at the time you can see why they're related concepts so you, you look at cars for example you know how many cars had production runs of tens of thousands or more and at the end of their lives they were pretty much scrapped en masse. Now, some of those cars may now be incredibly valuable collector's pieces, and people will pay millions of pounds or dollars or local equivalent currency to own one. But, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago or longer, when those cars were just around on the streets, if it broke down, people didn't think, oh my goodness, no, 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 I must source original components or I must fabricate new ones that exactly match the original specs and bring it back to its former glory. They're just like, oh, car's broken. Third time this week. Guess it's going to the scrapyard. Um, and again, this was uh, a similar thing with the US battleships immediately post-World War II. They were around, they were relatively recent combat units, and then again, for the most part, people looked at them as just another part of the US military machine, a part that wasn't quite as useful as some of the newer stuff that the US had, like the Iowa class, and so off they went to the scrapyard because not enough people really cared. When you look at not all, but the vast majority of museum ships that have survived, a good chunk of the reason as to why they have survived is simply because they went out of service, sat around in a reserve fleet or a mothball fleet or potentially even as a sort of half chewed up wreck somewhere, long enough for them to age out of the public consciousness as active units of the present and become relics of the past. And once they were relics of the past, then all of a sudden everybody's interested in keeping them because keeping old things is apparently good. And you see this all over the place. Um, I mean, HMS Belfast is around largely because she stuck around in the reserve fleet for ages and uh, 
happened to be in pretty good condition when they finally decided in the 70s that maybe we should preserve a World War II ship. Vanguard went to the scrapyard not because there wouldn't have been a drive to retain her, not because she didn't have a historical degree of significance, but simply because by the time someone decided to scrap her, she hadn't been around long enough for people to value her as old. Um, and the same thing with Dreadnought. Dreadnought, if any battleship has a claim to be a museum ship, Dreadnought would be the one, considering what she signified and the turning point that that she caused. But when the Washington Naval Treaty came around in 1921, she wasn't even 20 years old. So at that time, people said, oh yeah, well, she was a fairly revolutionary battleship at the time, but she's not now. The new ones are bigger and better, so meh, not a lot attached to being first of her type. Whereas, you know, if... If Dreadnought, I think, had been turned into an accommodation ship or something, or a training ship or something like that, and kept around and somehow made it past World War One, uh, World War Two, sorry, then even with the relatively crack cash strapped nature of the UK in the late forties and early fifties, if she'd gotten to that point, then yes, yeah, she probably would have then been preserved as a museum ship. Um, Albeit, you know, given the fate of poor old Implacable, don't necessarily hold your breath on that one. YFF asks, Is it better to have a compact superstructure arrangement or one that's more spread out all over the ship? Uh, for example, if you choose to build a compact one, you decrease the total area that can become a target, but then if you do get hit there, there are higher chances of causing multiple bits of damage to various elements. Personally, I think the compact single bridge or bridge module if you like with some appropriate backup spaced out elsewhere is the better way to go because as you mentioned one it makes it less likely for that collection of uh, things to be hit in the first place because it's in a relatively small target area but two yes if it does take a hit you might lose multiple systems but a battleship is such an integrated weapon system that scattering them about and therefore ensuring that almost any hit that isn't directly at the waterline is probably going to knock out one or more of the systems you would otherwise compact into a bridge structure is probably going to be almost as destructive to your fighting capability but have a much higher chance of occurring. And the reason I say that is because you know, battleships don't tend to go in for unnecessary systems. They do go in for backup systems, true. But almost everything that you'll find in and around a bridge tower on a typical battleship is in some way or another vital to the functioning of the ship. So you've, you've got your radio aerials strung from the mast, you've got your flag signals, you've got you know the command crew themselves, navigation, etc., You've got rangefinders usually stuck up high above, um, radar later on, uh, in World War II at least, and so on and so forth, spotting, light AA, etc. Now, you could argue reasonably accurately that yes, be taking a hit to the bridge could cripple multiple of those systems, you know, like the hit on Bismarck. Uh, even though it wasn't necessarily even a direct hit on the bridge, it still knocked out the command and control staff for the most part, as well as crippling their primary rangefinder and fire control systems uh, and various other things. I mean, the loss of communications probably wasn't so much of a problem because she didn't have anyone to really communicate to, but if she had had a sister ship or Prince Eugen or whatever with her, it probably would have knocked her ability to talk with them for six as well. But can you really, from all that list, think of anything that you, where the ship in a normal situation when it's not being just run down on its own could afford to lose any one of those systems without a significant compromise in its integrity you know if everything else is intact but your comms are down whether it's your signal flags are destroyed or your radio antenna is destroyed well now you can't talk to anybody so you can't tell anyone what's going on you can't if you are a flagship you can't order people to do things um you know loss of that system can and has lost battles in and of itself um, if you lose your primary fire control system uh, or range finding equipment well it's fairly obvious why that's bad if your bridge crew gets wiped out you know no more command and control until you can find maybe the first or second officer and get him to a backup command position 
and the list goes on. So whilst you might not lose every system, a hit to a vital system in a distributed layout is probably going to be almost as crippling to your ability to fight a large-scale naval battle, at which point you probably better to go with the option that just minimises the risk of taking a hit to those systems generally, i.e. the combat bridge structure, um, and as opposed to just you know losing bits and pieces one by one. The other thing is if you go with the compact bridge structure and concentrate everything in mostly one place, it means you have the rest of the ship to distribute your backup systems, which means that if the hyper, hyper unlikely event takes place of you losing everything within the bridge tower, as long as you've got somebody who knows how to man all the equipment, you should in theory at least be able to bring those functions back online relatively soon elsewhere. Eric24567 asks, Why did Admiral Lee choose USS Washington as his flagship instead of South Dakota during the Guadalcanal campaign? I mean, in hindsight, it was a good choice, since South Dakota did temporarily turn into Admiral Kondo's piñata, but didn't South Dakota have special arrangements to better serve as a flagship? Well, yes, yeah, South Dakota did have much better uh, accommodations and provisions set aside for acting as a flagship, but there are two primary reasons why Admiral Lee chose Washington as his flagship. First of which is he did initially hoist his flag aboard USS South Dakota, um, and that lasted for the figurative 10 minutes because South Dakota went into restock and resupply, which and she went in on a high tide. So she went in sh relatively shallow drafted on a high tide, stocked up, became somewhat deeper drafted, and went out on a low tide, passed over exactly the same spot she'd passed over previously without problem, and this time ran aground. As I mentioned in the video on Admiral Lee um, earlier, uh, it, well, at the time of uh, this broadcast in October. So with a hole in that side, South Dakota had to go back and get itself fixed, which left Admiral Lee with two choices, North Carolina and Washington. North Carolina was a bit away, Washington showed up, so Lee took Washington as his flagship, then North Carolina got torpedoed, so he was left with just Washington, and by the time South Dakota showed back up again having been fixed, Lee rather liked being on Washington and decided he was going to stay there. The other issue was that because the Washington predated the idea of a CIC, Combat Information Center, as with most other ships that had radar and other such CIC-esque systems jammed into them after the fact, they had to find somewhere to put it. And in this particular ship's case, they chose to put everything in what had been the Admiral's sea cabin, and that was very close to the bridge. So for Lee, who, as you'll know, hopefully by now from his video, was something of a technical expert, this was brilliant because it meant he could be on the bridge. And if he wanted to see what was going on with the radar and all the other fancy systems, he could take a 30 second walk and he'd be there. And then if they needed him back on the bridge, another 30 second walk or a 15 second run and he was back on the bridge. So this was great, at least until possibly if Washington had been shot in the superstructure, as was mentioned in a previous question. Um, but for Lee's purposes, this was fantastic. Whereas on newer ships, where such things could be taken into account, the US Navy's designers, to avoid having them knocked out by incoming fire, had put them all down below the armor deck. And, you know, there's no elevator or lift, as we call them in the UK, on a battleships superstructure so lee couldn't just step in and go okay you know deck three and down he goes he had to go down multiple flights of stairs or ladders to get to the radar plots and he didn't like that because it meant he could be in one place or the other but he couldn't be in both whenever he was needed and as a result he significantly resisted any attempt to shift him off of washington until he basically had no choice Matthew Kidd asks, Who was more disappointed by the general lack of battleship on battleship actions in World War II? Battleship captains and admirals or naval historians? I think it depends on the officer and it depends on the historian. Um, I mean, sure. As, as a historian in principle, of course, I'd love to have seen more battleship 
uh, on battleship actions in World War Two. Uh, it would have answered a heck of a lot of questions. <laughs> you, can, you, can you imagine, you know, if, uh, let's say, Tirpitz had sailed out to fight uh, Washington and King George V, for example, or Alabama um, on the Arctic convoy runs, or if um, Yamato had thrown down with um, Admiral uh, Deo's forces in, uh, to, uh, op during Operation Tengo, or if you'd had the Battle of Samar with Admiral Lee versus um, Admiral Karita, etc., etc. You know, so many questions we could have answered. Whose battleship would win in fight X fight with Y battleship? Um, but you have to temper that, of course, with the fact that every battleship fight involves the destruction of quite a few lives. And the admirals and captains knew that as well. So they were quite eager to get stuck in to do their duty and to change the balance of power in favour of their own country. But they're also equally conscious of the cost that that would involve, both in terms of the ship itself and the men who served under them. So whilst they were very eager to, to fight, they were also not too eager to fight unnecessarily, where there could be... Um, casualties that could otherwise be relatively easily avoided and so nothing really exemplifies that more than admiral lee admiral lee stayed in the pacific for nearly the entirety of the u.s's involvement in world war ii specifically because he wanted to be able to fight a battle line gun battle so he absolutely was disappointed by the fact he didn't get well more than just washington versus kirishima uh, but simultaneously, you know, as I pointed out in the video on Admiral Lee, he was also very conscious of when and where it wouldn't be appropriate to engage. So he wasn't uh, kind of, I must have my battle line battle at all costs whenever the opportunity arises. He was a case of, I really, 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 really want to fight this battle, but I will only fight this battle when it suits my ships and my men and I can guarantee, or near enough as you can guarantee anything in a naval war, that not only will we win, but we will win without subjecting my own side to an uncomfortable level of losses. Kaustub Ilindala asks, Could the Je ne Colle have been a good idea? This is a subject that does occasionally come up, but fundamentally... <laughs> Yes and no. Um, I know that's entirely unhelpful, but allow me to explain a bit more. Um, the Je ne Colle, the idea that you could get away with just using light craft and a small coastal defence fleet, I use cruisers for enemy, raiding enemy commerce, use destroyers to attack the enemy battle fleet, and maybe you have a few heavier units in the coastal defence role to keep your own coastline safe. If you're fighting a peer opponent, at the time that it's, the strategy is developed, it can kind of work, at least on paper. Um, so, for example, the Sino-Japanese War, in theory, shows that the Genical can kind of be made to work. The problem is that a lot of the predictions and principles upon which the Jeunecol is based, such as the efficacy of torpedoes, um, whether the torpedo boat's going to survive to get close enough, etc., etc., they're kind of disproven or badly knocked down a notch in that war, and there's a reason that the Japanese abandon a Jeunecol approach and go for a more traditional battle fleet approach later, even when they're dealing with approximate peers like uh, China at the time. But this fundamentally is the problem. You know, if if you can solve some of those issues, like, you know, are, are destroyers and torpedo boats actually going to be as effective as you think they are, then as long as both sides are limited to approximately equal resources and as long as both sides are using technology of the time of the Je ne Colle, then, yeah, you can probably just about get away with it. The fundamental problem with the Je ne Colle, however, is that it's designed to allow a smaller power with less resources and less money to defeat a larger power with more resources and more money. But it falls down the hole in that particular case of the pretty much most naval grand strategies tend to fall down, which is that it assumes the enemy will do nothing. And that's 
that is its single biggest problem and it's why it dies out because it turns out that if you have less money and less resources than the other guy if you build a fleet of small fragile fast attack craft and cruisers well guess what the other guy can build exactly the same or larger fleet of exactly the same type of ships or worse still they can build an same size or larger fleet of ships specifically designed to counter your new weapon <laughs> And they can have a battle fleet on top of it. That's what comes with them being bigger than you. And now you're stuffed because now not only does your enemy have a battle fleet and you don't, but all the other stuff you've built is now useless because your enemy has the perfect counter to it and they have more of them. Um, hence the origin of torpedo boat destroyers, amongst other things. So, yeah. It's one of those weird things of... In principle, it can be made to work in certain circumstances, but not in the circumstances it was actually originally designed for. Quiet Solo Pursuits asks, What was the source of friction between King and MacArthur? Was it personal, simple inter-service rivalry, or that King didn't want anyone from outside the Navy running any part of naval operations? Uh, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> it, it was a mixture of all of that. Yeah, there was a degree of inter-service rivalry, um, between the army and the navy but it was a lot bigger than that as well king absolutely did not want the pacific war being run by anyone who wasn't part of the navy and he definitely didn't want anyone who wasn't part of the navy getting themselves involved in naval operations um and to be honest he had fairly good reason for that uh, macarthur was not in any way shape or form an easy person to get on with by any account, even by people on his own side. Um, he also, by most accounts of his contemporaries, was nowhere near as good as he liked to portray himself as. Uh, the fact that he had a relatively successful post-war career seems, at least to my reading from the evaluation of, as a contemporary high-ranking officers, to have been predicated more on the basis of his own personal propaganda machine than actual competence um, and he could get myopically fixated on certain objectives that he thought sounded good or uh, appealed to his pride um, like his whole I will return to the Philippines well actually technically by most US Navy evaluations the invasion of the Philippines was not in and of itself necessary to the completion of the destruction of the Japanese war effort and finalizing the war with Japan um, they could have done it without that but they were forced into uh, supporting the invasion of the Philippines basically on the because MacArthur had made a big song and dance about the fact that he'd be back um, so yeah I mean I, I may be being slightly harsh to MacArthur because obviously um someone who doesn't like him in the first place whether that be admiral king or any almost any other u.s navy admiral and a number of u.s army generals as well obviously isn't going to be somewhat one-sided but there's enough of them that macarthur to me seems almost like an in-uniform american version of churchill in world war one i.e he has good ideas he is sometimes useful at um, motivating people to get on with a job but he's also incredibly difficult to deal with and really really should not be let anywhere near the finer finer uh, intricacies of tactical planning uh, because you know that that doesn't seem to be his strong point considering that you know he thought a full frontal attack on Rabaul was a good idea um, bearing in mind that when it came to it, even at the time that when the US Navy could have contemplated a full-on assault at Rabaul um, later in the war, when they had an absolutely overwhelming advantage, they looked at it and went, for the gains that we would receive from dealing with this, we would take far too many losses to make it worth it. And that's the US Navy by which at the point at which they're receiving a truly ungodly number of Essex-class carriers, amongst other things. So, 
perhaps that puts it into a little bit more context when MacArthur's turning around in 1942 and going, yes, clearly the best thing we should do is throw our somewhat strung out and depleted forces in a full frontal assault on one of the most heavily fortified Japanese naval bases in the southwest Pacific. Clearly, this is a brilliant idea. And everybody else turning around and going, mm, how about no? And to a certain degree, I think there was a kind of a self-reinforcing loop. Uh, King would almost certainly not have liked anyone who was able to exercise control over part of the Pacific theater partially or wholly independently of his thinking. Plus, adding in the fact that it was an army general as opposed to another naval officer, plus adding in the fact it's not is not an officer that's very easy to get on with, all of this is going to lead King to be looking for reasons why he's right. Because he's going to be sitting there going, this is a bad idea, I don't like it, I hate it, this shouldn't be happening, I should have full control over the Pacific War Zone, this army officer is going to screw something up majorly, okay, what is he going to do wrong? And then, when he's already looking for faults, given that MacArthur's already lost the Philippines, so that's already a massive black mark against him in King's book, um, regardless of how feasible it was actually would have been to hold the place. And then he starts coming out with all this stuff about, you know, attacking the most heavily fortified Japanese positions and all various other kinds of uh, weird ideas that, he, that MacArthur came up with. Then King is effectively sitting there going, yeah, that's exactly the kind of nonsense I'd expect from someone like you. Now I hate you even more. And then he's going to be less cooperative with MacArthur, which is going to make MacArthur even more difficult to deal with. And then MacArthur's going to try and come up with some even bigger genius galaxy brain scheme just to show those silly Navy officers what he can do. And thus the cycle repeats itself until there's kind of a, a singularity of hate going on. Although I rather suspect with poor old Admiral King that that singularity of hate was probably not an uncommon thing for him to encounter. Ralph asks, would Admiral Sturdy have been a better choice for Jellicoe's replacement than Admiral Beatty? Um, absolutely yes. <laughs> um, now, to be fair, I think Admiral Sturdy would have made a worse first sea lord than Admiral Beatty, because as I've said before, Admiral Beatty's political acumen and connections meant that he was probably about the best place to officer you could ask for to be first sea lord in the post-war environment but for replacing admiral jellicoe as commander of the grand fleet um yeah sturdy i think would have been a much much better uh person to lead the grand fleet now there's a few reasons for that one of which is sturdy as you can see from the battle of the falkland islands is not reckless he knows how to press his advantage but he also knows you know if i have an overwhelming advantage i'm going to use it a bt style of um aggressiveness would have probably sent everything after one german unit or another so either the scharnhorst and gneisenau would have been hunted down by the entire flotilla including the light and armored cruisers or he would have got distracted and gone heading off after the German protected cruisers, on presumably on the theory that Invincible and Inflexible could eventually catch up to Spey, and then he would have lost one or the other. Whereas Sturdy calculated very ruthlessly, this is the amount of force I need to defeat them, and this is the amount of force I need to overkill that unit, I will therefore dispatch those. And that leaves me with these forces. Can I overkill the other enemy unit? Yes, well, then I will dispatch them separately. Um, that I mean, that kind of split chase, even if Beatty had come up with the idea of it himself, if he was in command of the Falklands, well, you can see from Dogger Bank just exactly how well he would have executed that kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, also, Sturdy didn't have someone who really didn't have much clue what he was doing as a flag officer, which kind of helps as well. <laughs> um, and the re the other reason is that Sturdy had some ideas about some innovative tactics. He was, as I say, a little bit more conservative, a little bit better thought through when it came to how he was going to use uh, his ships. 
but he wasn't short of a few bright ideas either. Um, there's a reason Jellicoe, kept, as I've said before, kept him close within the Grand Fleet, specifically to stop him herring off and doing something particularly novel. So Sturdy wasn't a complete conservative when it came to tactics. Now, OK, maybe in 1915, in 1916, um, maybe even in early 1917, that particular approach may not have been the best to risk the entire Grand Fleet on. But by the time Jellicoe is moved onwards and upwards and there's a slot for Commander of the Grand Fleet coming up, at that point... The Grand Fleet does have the material strength and advantage over the Germans to actually implement some of Sturdy's ideas without there being a tremendously major risk. Because bear in mind, after the episode of Jutland, the High Seas Fleet replaced Lutzau with Hindenburg, and that was it. There was no further increase in the strength of the German battlecruiser fleet. The British, admittedly, they had lost three battlecruisers, but they brought in Renown and Repulse, which, okay, hull-wise, left them one down, but they also got Australia out of dock, which meant their hull-wise was a net no increase, no decrease. But whereas Hindenburg was pretty much a like-for-like for, like for Lutzow, it's fairly obvious that Renown and Repulse are considerably greater advantages as compared to if we say Australia is replacing Indefatigable, then you know, Renown is clearly superior to Invincible and Repulse is somewhat superior to Queen Mary. Plus, the, I suppose you've also got Courageous and Glorious for what they're worth, but let's not go into that too much. But broadly, the point is the British battlecruiser fleet was materially stronger after Jutland once new ships had came in, whereas the German first scouting group was basically at the same strength. And likewise, the High Seas Fleet itself, they obviously got rid of the last pre-dreadnoughts, but all they would receive capital ship-wise afterwards were Bayern and Baden. Now, fair enough, pretty much the most powerful units to sail with the High Seas Fleet during World War One. The British got the balance of the R class, plus um, the the various the, the um, Queen Elizabeth coming out of dock. So not only did they receive more ships, but you know, all heavy fifteen-inch gunships, and timeline-wise, pretty much soon after Sturdy would have taken command of the Grand Fleet, he also gets Sixth Battle Squadron, i.e., the Americans coming over to play, and once they you know address the gunnery issues there a little bit that gives sturdy a massive material advantage even greater than what the british had at jutland over the germans so at that point some of his should we say more interesting ideas like pincer moving maneuvering the german fleet actually could come into play without a trem tremendous amount of risk to the grand to the grand fleet and the british war effort so he would have had access, therefore, to his full repertoire of ideas. The more conventional ideas, definitely. Obviously, he has the firepower to do them, but his more radical ones are still available to him. And, of course, as was proved by Admiral King's observations during uh, 1917 and 1918, Sturdy was entirely capable of outmaneuvering and beating and getting him dead to rights. So he was fundamentally a better tactical commander against the man that we're considering replacing him with as proven at least as far as you can in exercise adam brooker would like to know what's the source for when Beatty cancelled the war games on exercise and admiral king was watching there are three sources that you can look at there it's mentioned briefly in the biography of admiral king by thomas a buell which is titled master of sea power then it's also mentioned in Admiral King's autobiography, um, Admiral Ernest J. King, A Naval Record, which is considerably older, published in the 19, early 1950s before his death. And then if you want to get really, really technical, you can also look up the exercise logs for the Grand Fleet for the time period, bearing in mind that Admiral King well, was present with the Grand Fleet in late 1917 and, and then into early and mid-1918. And there you... Well, you'll find the various exercises that Grand Fleet did, and you can then find the exercises where 
beaty and sturdy uh, were on the opposite sides and <laughs> how each exercise ended albeit obviously written in navalese rather than and then admiral beatty threw a fit and decided to go home with his ball captain lorenzo asks circa 1870 steel could be produced albeit expensively so say in 1870 you had a six inch gun and uh, hypothetically could a sub-caliber hardened steel penetrator been made using a sabo for centering using the technology of the day uh, fired from a smoothbore cannon, the projectile could be fin stabilized if desired, and if this were possible, wouldn't this hardened all steel sabre round have a much higher muzzle velocity by virtue of its smaller weight and have superior penetrative capability on the ar iron armor of the day? And assuming the sabre round was able to penetrate the armor of the day, would the higher kinetic energy upon penetration have significant deleterious effects on the receiving crew or ship, or would it not be a viable option? In theory, you could manufacture such a thing. In practice, you might run into a few issues, the first of which would be trying to work out how to get a proper release from the Sabo encasement, if you like, in order to allow the Sabo itself to fly free. Now, it could be done, it's within the technological capabilities of the time period, but whether or not it could be done reliably enough to make it a viable weapon is one thing the second thing would be that if you were going to use it in anything you might as well use it in one of the rifled muzzle loaders or towards the end of the 1870s the rifled breech loaders that were entering service in various navies because the smoothbore guns whilst manufacturing tolerances were considerably higher than they had been in the age of sail there were still some accuracy issues so if you use a smoothbore sabo round, there's a high chance you'll just get a very high velocity miss. Slightly, there's a slightly higher chance of that happening than if you have a rifled muzzle loader or breech loading muzzle loading gun, which can breech loading rifle gun. What am I talking about? Sorry, um, which can uh, theoretically put more shots on target. Now, if you can manufacture the steel and harden the tip to the correct amount, then yes, you would get superior penetration compared to just solid iron shells, albeit that the harder iron shells that were sometimes experimented with at this point did have some issues with shattering on impact. So you'd have to do quite a bit of testing and variations on the metallurgy to make sure that you didn't just smash your, your sabre around to pieces upon impact because of the much higher energy involved. Assuming that could be overcome, and again, technically speaking, the technology is there to do so, then yes, it's going to penetrate with much more kinetic energy a, well, relative for its weight because bearing my mass does affect things and yes anything directly in its path is going to be rather dead however one of the problems that you'll run into which is generally a problem with any kind of um, sabo or heat kind of idea for a naval shell is something i've referenced before which is simply that ships are incredibly large so if you have, as you say, a six inch gun and you fire, a, let's say, a three inch Sabo round from it, there's only so much mass that round can have. And by making it a lot harder at the tip and a lot tougher generally in order to survive the impact in the first place, you also make it somewhat less likely to fly apart into many pieces once it gets inside. It might still break, but... Um, if it does, it's going to break into fewer bits. And so once it's inside, the overall effect within the ship is actually going to be substantially less. And so you're probably going to end up with a case of, well, there's a three inch hole in the side of the ship. Well, that can be fairly easily patched. There's a trail of destruction in its direct path. But if it hasn't hit anything vital in its direct path, there's probably not a lot that's happened outside of that. And even in the 1870s, you know, capital ships at least are topping 10,000 tonnes. There's an awful lot of internal volume to absorb that kind of hit. Uh, 
whereas if it's a six inch round which even then in the 1870 early 1870s is a secondary round by that point really if that is a solid iron shot a it's more likely to come apart and b when it does come apart there's so much more mass for it to scatter through the rest of the ship so let's say you put a round into a gun deck your three inch sabo if it hits a gun will probably disable that gun if it doesn't hit the gun is may even just go straight out the other side or at least stick in the opposite side of the ship and that's it whereas the six inch solid iron round if it hits anything even if it hits the other side of the ship is going to disintegrate into a cloud of iron splinters which in turn will do a fair bit of damage in and of themselves and this occurs more and more as you scale up so as a way of disabling the ship's crew or the ship's armament unless you can specifically target it to a specific weapon such as let's say by the 1870s you're talking about something like hms devastation if you can target a 12 inch gun with say an 8 inch saber and you can target it accurately enough to say knock out an enemy's turret or knock out a gun in an enemy's turret in those circumstances yeah the saber would be better been in all other circumstances to be perfectly honest you'd probably be better off with just your regular shot or shell um, and unfortunately despite the incredibly close ranges that we're talking about uh, in this period it's probably not the guns aren't accurate enough to ensure that kind of sniper level accuracy where there could be some some benefit for it would be for older sort of eight, mid 1860s late 1860s ironclads that have been come obsolete then you could increase the punch of their guns and since most of those are broadside ironclads they've probably got enough guns that you can throw enough of these small sabos at somebody as opposed to turret ships with fewer guns where something vital will be hit whereas their smaller guns on the broadside ironclads couldn't necessarily otherwise pierce the armour at all. Ryan Frederick asks, Please consider the following three Jutland scenarios. One, Jellico makes the same equal speed manoeuvre but to starboard instead of port. Two, the Grand Fleet forms on the centre, apparently Churchill's preferred solution. And three, the pincer movement tactic advocated by Admiral Sturdy. Okay, well, five minute answer so it'd be brief, but a deployment to starboard instead of port is almost certainly disastrous for most reasons the only thing it really has going for it is it means that the leading elements of the fleet are going to include some of the more powerful units so some of the operational revenge class and the queen elizabeth class which have tacked themselves onto that end of the fleet so the initial amount of firepower that can be brought to bear against the German vanguard is going to be slightly greater. However, almost everything else is against that idea. For one thing, obviously we know the Germans were bearing a course kind of northeast-ish. Um, so by deploying ineffectively in the exact opposite direction, not only is Jellico sailing away from the German fleet so the encounter is going to be much much briefer but also unlike the deployment to port where they managed to cross the German T you're instead going to get an opposing line so the British vanguard is going to probably encounter the German vanguard coming the other way and then they'll pass down the line in opposite bearings the individual amount of firepower that any ships can exchange is rather limited but the ships in each vanguard are going to take an awful lot of a battering more to the point with that kind of style of deployment the germans are probably going to be able to bring more guns to bear on the leading ships of the british line than vice versa just because of the angles involved assuming they don't miss each other entirely which means the british lead ships might well get chewed up which considering they're probably going to be the queen elizabeth which have already been somewhat chewed up may not end very well then you've got grand fleet forms on the center um now for a bit more understanding for those of you who aren't aware basically what this means is with the two deployments we've looked at so far well the historical deployment and the one that's basically its mirror image the outermost squadron takes the lead everybody turns uh, it together and you form a line and in either case the flagship ends up in the somewhere in the middle 
the Grand Fleet forming on the centre involves effectively all the uh, columns f coming in and forming a line where Jellico in Iron Duke is leading the fleet and then he can make a decision whether he goes port starboard or whatever. This is actually probably the worst of all the possible ideas because when everything deployed to port the Grand Fleet just about managed to get in a position to cross the T of the High Seas Fleet and was still to a certain extent sorting out its line. It was a close run thing. If they're sacrificing a lot of that ground by having what Jellicoe's port side battle squadrons come in towards him in order to form up, then you're not going to have that time. Even if Jellicoe makes the decision that he is going to go to port, by the time everybody else has formed up, he'll have sacrificed several miles of ground relative to his original decision, which means that you might get a partial crossing of the T, but you're more likely to just get a gradual convergence of opposing battle lines heading in vaguely the same direction, uh, at least vaguely easterly. Um, the Germans heading obviously slightly north, uh, north of that, the British heading somewhat south of that, which I suppose overall numbers-wise and gunpowder-wise does favour the British, but not anywhere near as much as you know, crossing the German T. Plus, Jellicoe's now at the head of the fleet, which means that in terms of signals that he has to make, they have to now be repeated all the way down the line, as opposed to in the centre, where they can spread both ways up the line. So the response time of the fleet, unless Jellicoe just effectively says, follow me and do what I do, is going to be somewhat more limited and in that kind of exchange of gunfire, obviously there is a risk if a ship gets hit badly and starts to slow or fall out of line, that can have a disruptive effect on the entire line. That's true generally, but in this kind of mutual parallel battering, it's more likely to happen. Yes, it could happen to the Germans first, but it could equally also happen to the British. The other risk with that is that if Scheer decides to pull his switcheroo and disappear off into the night his ships doubling back in the succession means that in this case the rear of the british line would be under consistent fire for an extended period of time whereas the forward part of the british line can't really do all that much to help initially because she is basically just running up and down uh, the aft part of the british line twice the pincer movement advocated for by admiral sturdy of the three, has both the best chance of success and the highest chance of going wrong um, of the three alternate options. So what Sturdy was envis envisaging was effectively two smaller deployments, one to port, one to starboard. So i.e. the historical manoeuvre that Jellicoe made, but probably terminating with Jellicoe's battle squadron, and then all the battle squadrons to Jellicoe's right, which happened to include Sturdy's, would go to the other side. This would then give you two columns um, on diverging courses of British battleships. In theory, if you've made your deployment right, you catch your enemy in between them, and then you can double your opponent, i.e. you have Jellicoe's uh, ships on one side, sturdy ships on the other, and they're both concentrating fire on the German vanguard from either side. And of course, well, unless it's the Nassau's or the Helgoland's, which are miles behind at this point, the German ships have to decide we can engage one side or the other, but not both, and that means whichever side isn't engaged basically gets free training ground practice level shots, which is probably going to end very badly for the German fleet. Now, that's in the ideal scenario. The reason why it could also end hilariously badly is because if the two sets of ships split slightly too far, you might end up with Jellico with half the Grand Fleet, running into the entire High Seas Fleet, at which point he is outnumbered, assuming obviously that Jellico turns to port, which is basically Sheer's dreams come true. He gets to exert the full power of, well, at least the High Seas Fleet ships that have caught up by this point, against a smaller fleet of British ships, and Sturdy may or may not be able to get back in time to salvage the situation. 
and it effectively all revolves around exactly what courses do these two sets of ships make. The absolute ideal, given the historic course and speed of the high seas fleet, would be, because obviously this deployment would also take slightly less time, would be Jellico making approximately the same course that he does for his ships going to port, and then Sturdy running almost directly south, maybe with just a hint of west put into it. In that case, with a slightly faster deployment and running further south, maybe Jellico running just a little bit more east than northeast, there's a relatively decent chance you actually do get this doubling manoeuvre effect going on. And Shear's in a lot of trouble because even if he doubles back on himself at that point, he's still trapped within two elements of the Grand Fleet. He's just sailing with them instead of in the opposite direction. So that's not going to end well for Shear at all. But if you go with a kind of Jellico steers his exact historic course um, more to the northeast and sturdy goes in the exact opposite direction i.e southwest and then they both try and turn in to to form parallel lines depending on exactly how long that takes you're either going to end up with sturdy or jellico running into the entire high seas fleet and the other having to desperately sort of hightail it to try and salvage that situation paul from chicago asks dr clark recently did a fine couple of lectures on interwar royal navy logistics one of the items that came up was the lack of fast fleet oilers prior to 1939 in the u.s and to a lesser extent the uk as they have had some older ones left over from world war one did the slower battleships simply not require fast oilers or to put it another way do only the later treaty battleships such as the south dakotas and kgvs require fast oilers the issue here is perhaps a slight mis comprehension of what a fast fleet oiler actually is which is understandable because i mean the term seems fairly self-explanatory but it's not when you're thinking in terms of battleships so a fast fleet oiler generally speaking is something that's capable in roughly the realms of 18 knots give or take some you can have a fast fleet oiler that's 16 knots obviously a fleet oiler that can break 20 knots is fast um, but you're generally talking kind of roughly pre-dreadnought speeds and the reason they're classified as fast fleet oilers is because they can keep up with the fleet at cruising speed and the cruising speed at least when you're at war in a combat environment of battleships regardless of whether they're standard types or treaty battleships is still going to be somewhere in 15 to 18 knot range um, occasionally there obviously is the most efficient cruising speed especially for the much older ships of 10 12 14 knots but in time of war you don't generally tend to cruise at that speed and also once the ship the fleet gets going um then you are going to be cruising at 16 18 20 21 knots if you're going up to full battle speed and if your oilers are capable of sustaining let's say 18 knots that means they can keep up with you thus you can refuel from them if your oilers are capable of 8 10 12 knots maximum speed which is the speed of a standard oiler you have a lot of problems because now you're either confined to purely traveling at your most efficient speed but quite slow and at that point your oilers are going to be absolutely thrashing their engines to keep up with you and that way you can refuel or you head out at a more reasonable combat cruising speed or indeed then you get up to action speed and you leave your oilers miles and miles and miles and miles behind you so effectively if you're going to deploy anything in world war ii whether it be an older battleship a cruiser squadron or fast battleships you need to have your oilers capable of at least absolute minimum 16 knots ideally 18 to 20 in order for them to even be somewhere in the vicinity of your fleet when you need refueling and that is what constitutes a fast fleet oiler um the slower oilers, yes, they exist, and yes, you can arrange rendezvous with them, but you can't keep them with the fleet. They're more useful, as I say, for either specific rendezvous for fuel, which is more useful for single ships, or for taking oil to and from anchorages and harbours, like Pearl Harbour or Singapore, rather than actually staying up with the fleet.
Jiri Stratil asks, how was coal transported from coal bunkers to boilers? I'm imagining a lot of people with buckets and later conveyor belts, but both were in really long passage through watertight bulkheads, so it doesn't sound like a good idea on a warship. That's a good question. Um, coal bunkers were, where at all possible, placed alongside the boilers for basically this reason to minimise the amount of internal transport needed. As you can see here in this cross-section, um, admittedly this isn't a warship, this is just a regular steamer, but you can see the coal bunker there is right next to the boiler, and then you'd have feeds from the bunker that ran either side of the boilers or perhaps at the end of a boiler array. Now, once you'd got that coal out of the bunker, hopefully in close proximity to the boiler, if it was right next to it, you could just shovel it straight in. But more commonly, the humble wheelbarrow was a very common method of moving coal around in short distances inside the ship. For longer distances, there were two primary methods going on. First of which was to shape the bunkers in such a way that they could be they could use gravity to feed the coal towards the points where you wanted to get it out, so sloped floors, for example. But there was also the job of coal trimmer, which was a specific role within the engineering department, and they'd have to actually go inside the bunkers a lot of the time and using either shovels or wheelbarrows or baskets or combination thereof, actually redistribute the coal so it was closer to the exits where it could be taken straight to the boilers and also to prevent the ship from being unbalanced by having too much coal in one area and not enough in another. But where there were considerable distances involved, there was also the option of some form of internal transport system. Now on a small warship or a relatively cheap warship, that may literally just be a case of a, a wheelbarrow gang. But on some vessels like a lot of 1870s large ironclads, they actually had little internal transit systems. So if you imagine a minecart uh, on its little rails, basically something like that. So you could have a bunker that was well away from the machinery spaces. You roll your little cart up on its rails, fill it with coal, um, either directly or by shovels, and then you could either push or it may be towed or propelled back towards the boilers where obviously it could be unloaded and your watertight bulkheads and doors etc would have to take account of that. And finally Dave Collier asks, I have heard it suggested that the massive bombard Mons Meg was once part of the armament of the Carrick Great Michael. Having seen Mons Meg in Adderagasl I have my doubts. What evidence is there for this and would it have even been possible? Yeah I'm with you on that one. Um, I can't find any specific direct documentary reference that says that it definitely was there's an awful lot of it is believed or it has been reported but they're never really quite sure on who exactly believes this and who exactly is reporting this other than the fact that you know it's a really big ship and a really big gun and they're roughly contemporaneous i honestly i could see someone sticking it on for a laugh as a bit of a prestige thing, maybe for a day or two, if they could find a crane <laughs> that could maneuver the blasted thing on. But most of the documentary evidence about it seems to suggest that it was on a solid carriage for the majority of the time. Um, the wheel carriage is somewhat of a later thing for Mons Meg, which suggests it very definitely wasn't on a ship on a solid carriage because you ain't moving it anywhere. Um, the recoil from that thing. Um, you would need an extensive amount of ropage to, <laughs> to be able to, you know, not have it either blow straight through the ropes or rip a good chunk of the ship off of itself. Um, and you're definitely not going to do a friction slide on it because, well, that might work if you strengthen the deck well enough to hold it, but um, then it's blown itself back into the ship and then now you've got to try and manoeuvre it forward again against friction which yeah that's that's not going to be fun so i doubt it and apart from anything else also you're talking about you know depending on which source you believe a, a cannonball of anything between 150 and 180 kilos um given that the 42 pounder i.e approximately 20 kilo round went out of use because it was too difficult for most people to try and load in a seaway. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, almost an order of magnitude more. I I would have very, very, very serious doubts about being able anyone being able to load it at all in a seaway. I mean, it was difficult enough to load the blasted thing on land. And in a sea battle, even if you somehow managed to get this thing safely installed, you would basically be limited to... Well, we loaded it while it's in dock. We hope the powder hasn't degraded in the weeks dash months it's since been at sea. And we really, 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 really hope that our one shot actually hit something and then that's it. So, yeah, I'm not holding my breath on that ever being a viable shipborne weapon or indeed being on the Great Michael. And that brings us to the end of this week's dry dock. Now, you will be fairly happy to know that I have finally got around to sorting out the schedule for the US trip in April. So, obviously, this is still technically provisional, assuming that the flight routes remain open and assuming that the ESTA visa, etc. is all approved. But hopefully that should all be working out in the next few weeks. But for those of you who might want to put a date or two down in the calendar, at the moment... The schedule runs as uh, flying out to Boston on Friday the 8th of April 2022. Um, sorting self out in Boston, etc. Me and the crew. Then on Saturday, we'll be in Boston looking at USS Constitution. Um, Sunday, assuming that it's open, we'll be looking at USS Salem. Monday... Uh, and possibly also Tuesday, we'll be in Fall River looking at USS Massachusetts and Associated Shipping. Um, Tuesday, if we'll either still be in Fall River or taking a rest today, because I've decided that rest days are probably a thing that we should be doing. Um, Wednesday, so this is uh, Wednesday the 13th of April, we'll be in Philadelphia looking at USS Olympia. Uh, Thursday and Friday, we'll be looking at USS New Jersey. Um, then Saturday and Sunday, that's the 16th and 17th of April, we'll be in D.C. looking around various Smithsonian exhibits. Monday the 18th, we'll be looking at USS North Carolina. And then Tuesday the 19th and Wednesday the 20th, one of those uh, days, we'll be looking at USS Yorktown, the aircraft carrier. Uh, the other day will be, again, kind of a day of doing our own thing. Um, Thursday will be again a non-ship visiting day because that during that point that day i've got, got to get from near north carolina uss north carolina to atlanta drop off the rv and get on an aircraft um, because then we'll be going from atlanta to la so uh, then friday the 22nd and then saturday and sunday we'll be in la looking at uh, the ships that are there there's various uh, ships in that vicinity at which point uh, some the crew will be flying home on uh, that sunday and then just me on my own will be heading down to san diego on monday so that's monday the 25th then depending on the availability of uss texas i'll either be heading to uss texas on the tuesday or possibly straight to mobile alabama uh, and to see uss alabama um depending again depends on exactly what's going on with texas at that point uh regardless wednesday i will be in mobile looking at uss alabama on thursday this is thursday the 28th i should be over in norfolk um looking at uss wisconsin and various other bits and pieces around there and then friday saturday sunday uh, again, I will be doing some stuff on my own and heading back home. So that's the current schedule. Yes, it's a little bit skew whiff. We're going uh, down the East Coast, then across the country, then working our way back along the South Coast and then back up the East Coast again. Um, and then it, it is leaving from Boston back to the UK. But that's just how things work out. Um, so hopefully... Uh, all ships will be open on those at those times i'm going to start emailing various ships to s make sure that they are open etc to try and conform to that schedule and uh, hope to see a few of you during the trip <laughs>